Okay, just up top, I'm so excited because we have our first mum review, which is also the first book review in general, but it's also from a mum, Sapphire Hampshire, amazing lonely conservationist and longtime podcast fan um, of the, like, however many episodes there are. <laughs> um, but she lives in New Zealand at the moment and sent the book home to the UK so she could read it when she gets back. And her mum read it and she sent a good review and I'm going to share it with you all because it's my first book review and I thought it would be... it's just important. Okay, so Saf's mum said, was a good read. Some, some of the bits are sad to read but are powerful, like people struggling etc. But I love the little positive story where one lonely conservationist has saved some money to give to another struggling Elsie and the next day she spoke to someone who'd lost their home and could immediately pass it on. She makes a point that this is important for non-conservationists, friends and family as well as for the Elsie. So shout out to Saf's mum. Um, I love mum reviews and if your mum reads the book please send me a mum review. I would love to be able to do mum reviews at the start of every podcast, that's my dream. Um, so if you did buy the book please give it to your mum and <laughs> I want to hear her reviews. Um, so yeah just a fun thing to start off this podcast with and let's get into the episode. <music> Hello and welcome to episode 5 of How to Conserve Conservationists. I'm Jesse and Todd is also here. Hello. And what are we talking about today? You've, you've artfully named the chapter, Let Me See Your Skills. Let me see my what? Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about the skills needed to be in the conservation industry. Um, but before we do, my book is out and you can get it anywhere you get your books. Well, I mean, not anywhere at the moment. The problem is when you're self-publishing, it takes like two weeks to distribute the book to every bookstore. So actually, by the time this is released, it probably will be in most places. Well, to be pandemic friendly also, it's available in online bookstores. Yeah, online bookstores. Don't walk into your local, uh, (laughs) very, very nice, lovely atmosphere, physical bookstore. Well, firstly, you should be staying home, but two, <laughs> if you are in a place where you can go to an actual bookstore, I think you can still tell them to order it in. Like, it will be in their database, and they could probably get it for you, but online stores. At the moment, it's definitely an I was Amazon. thinking, like, Black Books or something. Oh, like, books. if you walk into the... <laughs> He'll just give you a weird look. <laughs> yeah, why do you want this book for? It should. <laughs> um, <laughs> but... It's in Amazon for sure, Barnes & Noble, and there's bookstores I didn't even know of that it's in, like Kobo, Booktopia, Apple iBookstore. I think I knew that existed. I'm not really sure. But anyway, if you get your book, the chapters... All good bookstores everywhere. (laughs) If you get the book, our podcast episodes will no longer be a surprise to you, because if you haven't worked it out already, the titles of these podcast episodes are the exact same as the chapters, so you can read along with us and maybe... You can have your input in your brain because you can't respond to this conversation, but at least you might have some thoughts of your own. Anyway, you should get the book. Um, it's good. <laughs> but until then, keep listening to the podcast. Today, as I said, we're talking about skills. So I want to know from Todd first off, when you first met me and I said I was a conservationist, um, what was your perception of like the skills I had to had had to have in the industry versus like watching me for the past five years and seeing me try like every which new thing to try and like get my foot in the door like did the amount of skills I had to accumulate surprise you yeah well I I thought it would be a very highly specialized thing where I don't know for some reason conservationist if you used you, to be doing one animal so you just know everything about this one particular animal like from a biology point of view, but I guess that's not what conservation is, now that I say it out loud. But it turns out you have like a lot of just other practical skills to like do 50 different jobs. Yeah, and I is think... Is your argument. <laughs> I think what's interesting is like, I didn't really realise this, and I guess it led to a lot of imposter syndrome, um, thinking about like, oh, I'm just a conservationist. Well... Last year, I actually went through a business incubator program because I found out about this program that was supposed to give business acumen to environmentalists so that they didn't have to rely on grants or government subsidies to get their project underway. They could like, they could be sustainable 
Well, it, like in the conservation industry, is really rare that your idea is businessified. So they were trying to give well, like this does yeah. sound great, but like how much money is there? In there is a lot. I found out animals? there is actually a lot of money if you know where to look without like simultaneously sort of exploiting these animals. Yeah, arguably. Well, I think that the like conservation is moving in a different direction where they started to put a monetary value on ecosystem services conservationists are able to pair up with other industries like agriculture or like corporations that do have money they can still achieve conservation outputs in like new and novel ways so i think it was just trying to give that business acumen to environmentalists in the end my idea was a bit forced because i think of the environments that i was in people had obviously like a direction that they wanted the incubator to go they had already like um their own skill sets and jobs that they were thinking about when helping other people so i just realized at the end of the incubator that it was not for me and for lonely conservationists because success is different to business people i feel this is like weird to talk about but everyone in the incubator success was like figures and people of like members of staff they wanted people to be like okay you want to save the whales how about you start a whale watching tour business but now like your whole business is like a very practical aspect of like okay we have to you know hire the boat and port and dock and like marketing material how much money and how much money making? do we spend on this and how much do we sell the tickets for and like not much effort gets put into actually saving whales at that point you're just making money off of whales yeah and like my personal perspective is that all i cared about like success to me was like actual tangible outputs for conservationists not outputs for other people who may benefit from conservationists so yeah saying like oh man we like turned half a million dollar revenue this quarter you're like okay but that the whales are dying for me it's like the conservationists are still not happy yeah. so i think i i just measured concert uh, i measured success very differently and i think that i'm still i don't know i still have this like mental block when it comes to businesses and i think a lot of conservationists have this mental block when it comes to money that mm. like it's dirty to want money it's dirty to gain a profit because we grew up not being valued for our work volunteering thrift shopping like everything is very like thrifty that we almost feel guilty if we're in a money making environment but if you come across an entrepreneur <laughs> trying to make a quick buck you sort of turn your nose up but realistically like we need to survive we need to be paid money should be integrated into conservation and we shouldn't feel guilty about it like that's just a fact that we need money to do better work you do have to participate in a capitalist society <laughs> at some point so anyway this is kind of beside the point but <laughs> i was during this incubator program i was really struggling and i actually reached out to a lonely conservationist and she hopped on the phone with me and there was a point where i was like i can't do this i'm just a conservationist and that day really changed my life because she was on the phone and she's like Jessie think about the sheer amount of skills you have had to get to get this far in conservation whether it be like field work skills data analysis like just taking the data and all the methodologies you have to do like risk assessments sometimes you have to learn a different language you have to be able to like do oral presentations you have to write complex scientific reports you have to get blah 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 And then when I thought about the sheer amount of skills that I actually had to have accumulated over the years to get to where exactly I was today, I was like, oh, there's no such thing as just a conservationist. And I think this is why I wrote a whole chapter about it is I think that's so important for conservationists to acknowledge the amount of skills they have, but also to from like for people outside of conservation to acknowledge the amount of skills that we have instead of just thinking like all we do is look at whales. <laughs> Well, this is something I sometimes uh, float the idea of to you of like, you know, you're passionate about conservationism, that's where you put all of your life effort into. And sometimes it's a struggle to find a well-paid job doing that. But like you have lots of skills that are very transferable. Mm. Like it my my initial analysis of conservation has been a very specialized like, oh, I know, you know, every single trait about this one animal. That's not at all it. Like you're actually organizing projects, you're coordinating things, 
like learning new things all the time. Even a lot of lonely conservationists are very into science communication, which I think is actually the future of science. And there was this amazing quote I heard at a conference the other day, which is like, science is not completed unless it's communicated. And this is like similar to in your field where there's not a lot of IT nerds that are good at communicating and you are. So I feel like it's like a big asset to be able to communicate like very niche things to different people. And actually when Todd talks to me and tries to explain some complicated thing, he always makes up a weird metaphor for it (laughs) so I can understand. But to the point where it's like rubbed off on me, I was in the Lonely Conversationist um, workshop last night and I was trying to explain something and I was like, it's if I was a sultana in a world full of other fruits. And I was like, sorry, I don't know why I said this. (laughs) That is a weird metaphor. I know. I don't know how helpful that is. But I can relate to the Zoltana in the fruit bowl. <laughs> Sometimes it's also like, I don't know with Todd's stuff if it's too complex that if he explained it to me, I just 100% wouldn't know and I couldn't follow. Two, if it's top secret and I can't know. Or three, <laughs> like if he actually tried to explain it properly, could is there any chance I could understand? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, if you dig too deep, you get into like the weird technical details. Like... You spend a while trying to find evidence of orangutans in a forest, and it's like, well, you can't just go around and see orangutans because they're a bit sneaky. So you look for like, okay, if we find the food that they eat a lot, then we know that they might be around. But then like, okay, what plants do they eat? Uh, you're not a plant person. Now you have to learn like how to recognize all these different plants. And like, oh shit, this is a slight version that is poisonous. And like, you could talk for hours about like the different plants. In this one particular area, which would like bore most people, but like, so you have to like sum it up and be like, we looked for the plants that the orangutans thought were yummy. If you're going to speak to different people about it, and you won't tell about like, oh, the technical details. You know how I know you're a bad biologist. A bad, well, yeah. Because well, I, this is just because there's a plant <laughs> that is a food source of an animal doesn't necessarily mean the animal's there. It would be okay, better to fine. look for orangutan nests or their poop. All right. I'm, <laughs> I'm not the. Or when they spit out here. the food, when they chew it for ages, and they spit out the stringy bit. This is just like <laughs> you're not a biologist, but this is just what's going through my head when you're talking. You idiot! <laughs> not you idiot. That's not how animals work. I'm just critiquing you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like. Um, I'm this- just saying, if there's an area where there's food that Todd enjoys, you're more likely to find a Todd there. <laughs> this is. A good segue to, f- to say that I think this is the first chapter in the book that Todd is actually mentioned because <laughs> I introduced Todd as somebody who is not a conservationist, obviously, by that last <laughs> <laughs> conversation, but he has so many skills that throughout our relationship have consistently been applied to the conservation industry. Like, so when we first met, it was like, a month before I was about to go do my honours research in Indonesia. And I basically said, we can't be together because I'm going to go off to a third world country for six months and you will probably never see me again. And then Todd Todd decides to quit his job, buy a passport and come with me for the last four months of my trip, which was very unexpected. And there was a point... Well, I thought it'd be fun to come over for a couple of weeks in the middle of the six months, just as like, hey, how's it going? I'm no, going to pre- that's kind pretend of, to be doing a favor for you, but actually have a personal holiday. That's kind of taunting. Like, yeah. if you are in a new relationship with someone and you don't see them for a long time, and then you see them for two days, that's worse. Well, to be fair, like, what am I going to do there for like five months? Well, And then you had the idea. I talked to my boss. I was like, okay this guy is coming over to see me but he is actually he has drones of his own and they actually in the forest use drones to survey the canopy so they could find orangutan nests this is why i'm surprised you don't know about the orangutan nest situation (laughs) 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 but i guess you were just involved in the technical side but the thing is this organization we're working for had amazing high quality drones sitting in the office but nobody knew how to use them so High quality is a strong word. Well, I mean, they weren't like... That was like the problem though. They had like a bunch of bits and bobs lying around. So I could come in and like put them together and make something workable. Yeah. Even then arguably useful. So I remember like the first time, the first day Todd was there and in the office, he was at the backyard, like surrounded by all the people in the office 
flying his little drone and then like within a week he was out in the forest teaching the national parks department how to fly drones but it was so hilarious because i'd been there already for months at that point and i like could speak the language and i had this rapport with people but todd like almost had no desire to learn the language at all <laughs> so for him to be able to teach people to fly drones but not be able to communicate in a traditional sense was really interesting to watch because there was a lot of crashes but then they all picked it up so I was like very impressed at how you could communicate technical skills to people who didn't even speak your language yeah I mean I don't know if you want to actually want me to talk about what I did there well you can talk about what you did it was like two layers of it so like to actually fly the drone and make useful uh, you know photos with it and stuff is not crazy difficult you could pick it up in half an hour which is what i was teaching them but the problem they had was like the drones would be like half broken and half put together and like to teach them enough about how to put together the drone in the first place is like weeks and weeks of telling them about stuff or troubleshooting yeah troubleshooting like if something went wrong like you know it, it takes me hours to work out what's wrong with this thing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm somewhat clear with it. So I'll just do that myself and, like, fix it up as best I could and, like, point out, like, oh, if this light flashes red a lot, watch out. <laughs> like, that, given pointers like that for troubleshooting. But, like, the actual flying of the drone, you know, if, if kids who play video games, it's the same sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, but how many Indonesians who live in, like, oil palm plantations grew up with video games? So it well, that's what blew my mind. So, like, you know, they, yeah, they didn't grow up with, you know, high expensive video game consoles, but like, very cluey. <laughs> like, yeah, picked the, up on it immediately, I, had no problems. I wonder if some parts of it is just innate. I don't know if it, if technology is designed to be like very user friendly from the get go, but there must be some kind of, okay, this toggle moves it up and down. And this one moves it like left and right. Yeah. Once you explain, I remember that once. I had to write out like a cheat sheet of like the Indonesian words for like up, down, left, right, forwards, <laughs> and like just try to memorize those words so I could like point. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just like, say that word. The only words Todd remembers today is like left and right and food. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> it's all you need. But it's crazy to me because so he came with me. He did that. And then afterwards, I went to a... I had a job in New South Wales where Todd stayed back in Adelaide for. And so basically, I was the only 20-something-year-old in this whole place. Like, basically in the whole town, I was the only 20-something-year-old because it was very, like, a rural country town. Mm. And um, I remember like hearing a whitbird outside the window my first day and I was like oh my god if anyone doesn't know what a whitbird is the call is it sounds like a whip like I can't I can't do it if I did it would be bad but imagine it's like (laughs) like it it sounds like a whipping sound that's pretty close to me a whip is like a crack of a whip like yeah I don't know it don't sound like (laughs) but um basically I was like my bird senses started tingling And if anyone follows my bird Instagram, you might have been thinking that I've been birding for a long time and like kind of have since Madagascar in 2014. Like that's what I did as a job and it got me like onto like bird identification and bird surveys. But I hadn't gone back to do anything nerdy about birds until 2017 when I was at this place. And I had this innate desire to learn every single bird on the property as how I would pass the time as the only person my age in this situation. So yeah, I like how you're, you're oh man, all these boring old people, they don't know what fun is. I'm going to start bird watching and that's what the well, young we'll, kids We'll talk do. about it in future episodes. It wasn't necessarily that they were boring, but more clinically insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, that's for another time. I was originally just trying to look at the birds just sit outside and and look and remember their features and then identify them and put them in this spreadsheet but like then it was the 18th century yeah. or something <laughs> but after a while it's like todd can you find me a birding camera because i just like i needed a way for those birds i'd never seen before and that were maybe high up to zoom in and identify them so he found me this really it was a good first beginner's 
baby's first camera, <laughs> like a bridge yeah. camera with really high zoom. Well, that's just where like I'm a, a slight camera nerd. So in my life, I've probably spent like 20 hours learning about cameras and different types, which is 20 hours of knowledge and Googling you didn't have on yeah. you. So <laughs> I was able to spend an extra 10 minutes and be like, oh, you know, this kind of, they make this sort of camera that's all in one, really ch- relatively cheap, zooms in a lot. That would probably work great. You love it. I think Todd's a bit salty now because he used to have a Flickr back in the day and was like into photography and then... I got this camera and then when I took my first bird photo that was like actually um, like turned out good like it was very <laughs> it wasn't just like a blur. artistic it was like because I never intended to do it for photography purposes I intended it to be a tool to help me identify it's a very practical record of the bird you saw yeah but when I took an accidentally good photo I was like <laughs> oh can I do this again? And then I was hooked on bird photography and now I think Todd's a bit miffed that I've taken his photography shtick. <laughs> You're much better at taking photos than I am now. Well, I do it a lot more. To well, that's, that's all skill is, like having invested time in something. True. And I invested a lot of time. That's all I did. It was after yeah. work, sit outside for hours <laughs> photographing birds. But the thing is, a lot of people in Melbourne that I'm friends with are plant people. So they're all photographing like little... Or- orchids and like plants and they don't move unless there's a slight breeze yeah taking photos of birds <laughs> is like really hard but to i make. didn't realize that it was like such a skill to take photos of birds until all my plant people were like oh i could never they're just too far you just walk around and see a bird in a tree and take a picture of it and it like looks like this artistic shot from national geographic well oh, like actual bird photographers they were like set up little feeding trays and like in a perfect spot and then like put an artistic branch in the right <laughs> angle that they want and like okay we'll line it up all right we'll just hope that a bird comes along and sits here like it's I a different like technique that. i mean like i think there's a difference between and maybe because i'm a conservationist and there's a lot of people in photography that are artists mm. and that's more of like an artist flair is you're like i want the bird with this perfect background where i want to show like the context of the bird yeah it is the bird in it's more natural habitat like to tell a story so yeah it's interesting like even so for the i've been doing that since 2017 and i've improved my camera since then i think i hope i've improved my skills (laughs) but it's just well you like said get this camera it's pretty decent and then it comes out of the box and it's set to like super low quality it was like 0.3 megapixels and it wasn't until i went home to todd like three months and i was like why are your pictures like a freaking iPod Nano took them or something. <laughs> yeah, so Todd only realized that I'd been taking photos in lower quality than my phone after three months of me having the camera because obviously I'm not a technical person. I was just like point shooting um, for the first three months that I had it. I think that's a flaw of the camera. Well, in the view. <laughs> I didn't even think to adjust the settings or anything. Like uh, the first thing I knew was, what's the, the point? <laughs> Spot metering. Like basically, Ooh, yeah. spot metering is something Todd taught me. And if you <laughs> have if you have your camera, it's like a little dot with two brackets around it. But basically, I call it the bird setting because it hones in on something specific <laughs> and focuses on that. And if you have little birds, it's good to you. Yeah, if you've got this tiny little bird, you want like the image to look good for the bird, not for the big bright sunlight behind it or the dark branch next to my it. new camera i think is too specific because it will take this tiny little twig in front of the bird and yeah focus it's on like that. oh you want this twig gotcha <laughs> this twig looks amazing now but the- i guess like my point of going into all this is that todd is not a conservationist yet he's helped me achieve so many conservation goals he's helped people from all over the world do so much for conservation yet he would never consider himself to be a conservationist or introduce himself as a conservationist nor would you based on my knowledge of what orangutans <laughs> no, eat but that, i said you're not a bio- biologist like you, yeah uh, as we so said that's what I, there's different everyone has like different skills which is not really like I don't believe people are talented at things. I feel like you just spend time at something and you get good at it and knowledgeable in it. Yeah. Ta- so like, people only have so much time in their life to get good at stuff. Are you saying you could be good at everything if you had infinite time? If you had, well, yeah, if you had infinite time, yes. But the reality is no one has infinite time. So no one is good at everything. True, true. So I know in my job, like, it, the people I work with are really clue with computers, right? Because mm-hmm. like, not just their particular little niche professional job, but like they'll be good at computers in general. And then they'll be like, oh, I can't believe, you know, 
my my parents, my grandparents, you know, family members, they have no idea how to use a computer. But like, you know, they have their own lives that doesn't revolve around computers. They might be so good at crocheting. Yeah. And I don't know how to crochet. Yeah. <laughs> like they know heaps of stuff that you don't. But was, it was it was very very uh grounding to be in Indonesia where you know, I was teaching how to fly drones. These people are like, you know, what do you mean you don't know what for up is and stuff like it is a weird way of thinking like three dimensions flying an object mm. but like you know these dudes were people who have like phds in uh 50 different things like no. they were way smarter than me like overall probably i think they were like the government employees are like you just government employees <laughs> <laughs> anyone who works at any government but like not the, that clue. the people who worked in the field Started off as villagers, were hired by Panute. Also, well, even them, like, they would just sit around in the field all day. You know, they didn't know a lot about computers and, like, GPS technology that I did. Mm. But, like, I play chess with them. They would kick my ass at chess. They get a coconut and want to drink out of a machete. They would oh, yeah, be much. Really I tried to that. cut a coconut with machete and I just, you know, fumble like an idiot and almost cut my hand off. Like, they're way better than me in a lot of things. That's the thing, is that I think this is back kind of to the imposter syndrome thing, is we all think we have to be, like, the best of the best, but really it's about acknowledging what you bring to the table and what your skill set is. And I think when we apply for jobs, now I have this kind of newfound confidence because I have acknowledged (laughs) for the first time what my skills actually are and the depth of them. Whereas if you just think, oh, I'm just a conservationist, which is what my previous mindset was it's easy to come into it thinking like oh i don't know anything like oh i i just look at whales all day like that's who i am as a person when really if you're like a like if you study cetaceans if you study whales you will do like techniques like mark recapture and i learned that so mark recapture is when you take lots of photos and you identify like the notches on the whale's fins or like you have these like identifying features that is that that is that whale um so you can look at all these different pictures and be like, oh, this is the same whale. So this whale came back. Like yeah. the picture from yesterday is the same as the whale from today. That sounds useful. They use the exact same technology in elephants, like using their ear notches. <laughs> so if you, are, if you are a whale scientist, you already know how to use mark recapture, which can be translated from like the ocean to the African savannah, which even that very niche thing is transferable skills, which yeah. I think is really cool. I think the point I was trying to make was like, don't take your own skills for granted. Because mm. you, this, you know, the Indonesian who chops a coconut really impressively in three seconds, just like, oh, there ain't no thing, you know, that's just how you chop a coconut. But like, to me, it's like, oh my God, you're so talented. And what was really funny, actually, is I learned Indonesian by playing cards with them. So yeah. I taught them a card game, but they obviously taught me the numbers on the cards. And like, it's interesting because sometimes, like, just the act of putting a card down is a word. Every number on the card is a word. Like, there's so much involved in language with cards and you might think like, oh, I just know how to play this one game of cards, but that can lead you to learning a whole other language. Like, something really simple you can do can be a gateway to, like, ten more skills. Yeah. Which I think, like, we, we just shouldn't underestimate the things that we can do because even, like, I love public speaking. It's so easy for me. I'd prefer to give 100 presentations then do any number of essays like if you gave me like jesse you can choose 10 presentations or one essay i would 100 percent choose the presentations but i know so many people get so much anxiety and they hate public speaking so something that you think is really easy and a no-brainer maybe like something that a company is having a hard time trying to find somebody to fit those skills yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> <laughs> and this is another thing that i talk about in the book is that I think another thing that Todd really brings to the table, as I said before, is communication. So if he's in an environment where there's all these technologically minded people who have not gone out to oil palm plantations or like they haven't seen the world in that way, when something comes on the news and they're so easy to dismiss it, he's able to explain and communicate what's happening, but in a way that like maybe I would do too technically. Like when in the last episode when you're like what's an ornithologist and i told you and then i continue to use that word and you continue to not know what that word was <laughs> <laughs> you would never do that when talking to people and you never do that with me <laughs> so i think that um also if you're outside of the conservation space like just say you are a lawyer you're really into conservation you all your social media is conservation you 
are like so sustainably minded at home, but in the office, none of your colleagues are in that space. You have a very important role in educating them, even like in small ways. You try to give the example of like me and my work colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> who are, uh, yeah, haven't spent six months in Indonesia surrounded by uh, animal lovers. Ugh, Maybe I hate don't that have... word. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I used it. <laughs> But it's interesting now because even after being at this job for two years, Todd has noticed that people's way of speaking is really different to you now than it was like in the beginning because you'll call them out on things and be like, actually, it's not what you think from the media. It's not what you think from your personal experiences. The situation actually has more depth than that. So now people are coming to you with like knowing that you have these different perspectives and adjusting for that when they talk to you, right? Yeah. It's um, it's still the same sort of thing of like how much time you spend in it. Mm. So like, if you don't know anything about conservation, like most people, <laughs> including <laughs> me, you 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 wouldn't know about all these like intricate details and like what the real deal is. So me having spent like very very little time and just hearing things from you, like I'm already like the expert in my office <laughs> when it comes to like all these things. So they see in the news like, oh, you know, this company wants to log this area, but you know, this other mob says no. Todd, you know, what's what's going on there? And they expect me to like know what's going on. <laughs> well, I think even though you know, there's some things that are really important. For instance, last night in the workshop, we were talking about people's perceptions of things like a spider phobia and how just education and exposure to spiders can help people like move past the phobia and I'm still working on this with Todd where jumping spiders seem to be the gateway spider but they're be- adorable beyond jumping spiders we're still having issues it's not like Todd kills them or anything but it's just like I'm the person that will grab it and move it outside and even the then... fact that you grab the spider <laughs> is what upsets me the most but even like the way that we can even find jumping spiders as a gateway spider is good <laughs> but then there's other things like misconceptions where there might be big conservation organizations who I'm not going to say any names, but you can probably like, if you're in the industry, know who I'm talking about, where there's like, they are very reputable, well, re- well renowned, but are actually causing a lot of damage to wild spaces because their information and their like research is not necessarily accurate. So there might be some, like, it's important for people like Todd to know the truth about things so that if they encounter somebody that's like, I'm going to give X amount of money to this well-renowned organization and then he might be like oh but have you considered this and this and it might like for me it's like a ripple effect where if like one person knows it spreads that information out to more broadly because the the conversation can continue but i i tell people all the time i i think that your partners if they're outside the industry your partners impact on conservation can almost be like more widespread than yours if they are educated because they're the one that's going to have conversations with people that you don't have access to as yeah. someone that's like deeply ingrained in the field. I can just, I can just convert my, you know, a couple months of experience into my conversations with everyone around me but who not, haven't had, who have like zero months experience. It's not even a couple of months experience because you've had exposure to like every project. I'm always downplaying. Like, <laughs> you, yeah. You've had exposure to everything I've done in the past five years and like what I've told you about my work before then, like there's some things that you just have like passive exposure to that you can pass knowledge on. Or if I have a, if I have a conversation with you and say, I can't believe that this happened with this company, you yeah. have that perception of that company and what goes on already without having to be in the field knowing about it. Yeah. <laughs> Who would have guessed most mining companies aren't the best moral conservationists well okay this is a good argument because there was so when i graduated my conservation undergrad biodiversity and conservation there was a lot of people who went back and tried to get specific degrees that could take them to a career in mining because that's where the the jobs are and realistically you need conservation specialists on a mining site Mm. to make sure there's like environmental impact assessments done to make sure that they're not like mining in a place that has critically endangered species. Realistically, that is a job that's very high paid and is necessary. 
but some people like I don't think I could ever work in a mining. Site. A lot of people are very skeptical. It's like, oh, just work from the inside. You can change them from the inside. Like, nah, it's usually it doesn't happen. <laughs> I don't know, my experience. Well, okay, this is kind of, this is like a, a thing that happened when I was in university. And this is a story that started with me watching a documentary about the thylacine, which is a Tasmanian tiger. Like, they used to be a native... Hey, there's more than one? Would you, there, there used to be a population of these oh. animals. <laughs> you said it was about the thylacine, the thylacine, which is a Tasmanian tiger. Yeah, the thylacine, a Tasmanian tiger. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, um, Tasmanian tigers were a native um, marsupial in Tasmania, which people thought were killing all the sheep. But realistically... I mean, they're called tigers. They weren't because their jaw structure doesn't even account for sheep. Like, they couldn't kill a sheep. You'd need an animal expert to even think of that. Because if you ask me, like, they're called tigers... (laughs) They little dog like critters. They're probably killing the sheep, right? I think it's the branding that hurts. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, basically there was a bounty on their head, and the last thylacine Tasmanian tiger. Can I just call them thylacines? Does everyone know what they are now? <laughs> no, okay. I would have no idea. What you're the talking last about. Tasmanian tiger was thrown out in the trash, in the rubbish. <laughs> literally. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um. So. I watched this documentary about this millionaire trying to clone a Tasmanian tiger back to life with these old dead cells from this old fetus in a jar. Yeah. And it raises all these questions of like, if you invest this money into cloning it and there's by chance it exists, it will probably only exist for three days. It won't have like, it won't be able to know how to be a Tasmanian tiger because it has no others, like other animals around it to teach it how to be. Well, it's, it's still the same thing of like different skills people didn't bring different things to the table if you're a you know geneticist the i don't know is cloner a a cloner. Just, you're, you're a clone person like that's that's your tool everything's gonna look like i can fix this with cloning yeah you know? well it just made me super mad because it's more for like academic purposes <laughs> there's I think. very there's a very like but you're like, that is not the right tool for the job. There's a parallel similarity between Tasmanian tigers and Tasmanian devils, which still exist today. They are both in Tasmania. But they have this disease, which they get like a nose tumor from because they eat carrion. They eat dead animals on the side of the road if they have diseases or if one has a tumor and another one's eating at the same time because they eat pretty viciously. They could get scratches on their nose and the bacteria can transfer and then they can like heaps of populate like a lot of Tasmanian devils have these nose tumors and their populations are dying out there is like i think a safety population in new south wales where they're just trying to keep them a healthy population Tasmanian devils in new south and, uh, wales they're just trying to save this like population of healthy Tasmanian devils so that if all of them get wiped out on in Tasmania they can release them back yeah it's very complicated but It made me so angry that they were investing millions and millions of dollars in trying to clone back a species that would not be viable when they could have been investing that money into the Tasmanian devils because they had the exact same bounty on their head. Mm. They, like, had a very similar journey of, like, how they came to decline and why aren't we using that money to increase their population and why are we using that money to, like, try and clone a dead one back to life? So. Just just from like a where humanity puts its resources. Yeah, I was so mad to the point where I was watching this late at night and I was in my second year of uni, I think, and I just got onto the internet and I was like, I have to do something about this. Like, I obviously am so angry that people... Do people are... realise how stupid this is? I'm like, I'm, I am so angry that people are not doing the right thing and putting their money and their voice where it needs to be. I need to do something. Mm. So it inspired me to create a petition to take palm oil out of Subway sandwiches. And so there's two parts to this. Hang on, wait. This One, Tasmanian tigers have nothing to do with palm oil yes. or sandwiches. This is my point. <laughs> two, I actually worked for Subway at the time. So that's how I knew on all the boxes of bread mm. they had palm oil as an ingredient. I mean, it's written there. Yeah, it was written there. Um, so basically, like before, I had sent them an email saying, like, "Hi Subway, uh, I'm an employee. I notice you have um, palm oil. Is there any way we can have a conversation about this?" No response. So I was like, "Okay, but maybe people don't know about it." I make this petition. <laughs> Next day, I get a call. Hello, 
is the petition is the petition site. We think your um, petition is very achievable if we get enough voices behind it. Can we do a media campaign for your course? And I was like, yes, of course. Is but- this how some <laughs> change.org petitions explode and yeah. some have like three signatures? Yeah, this is exactly it. <laughs> <laughs> and then basically um, it went viral overnight and in the next week I had a company car of Subway taking me out of my GIS lecture, bringing me to the head office of Subway Australia. So this is something I did because at the time I was very ignorant, right? And I thought boycotting was the solution. Since going to Indonesia, working in oil palm plantations, like actually researching, I now know that boycotting is not the solution. Palm oil actually gives the highest yield per hectare and could be the most sustainable option if it was used more efficiently or more sustainably. Yeah, it's... It, it unfortunately it's not like palm oil is the problem it's yeah chopping down forests to put palm oil there is the problem yeah I think... and then like we also discover like oh wait, it's, it's actually like a bit of neo-colonialism going on as well and like it's fucked up yeah in so many layers as well and basically that's kind of why so they made this promise to reduce it like to remove palm oil by 2015 and i don't even know if they did i don't think they did like they they were just really scared. <laughs> so in the end, there's still palm oil in the subway. Sandwiches, oh, I'm not sure because and I, you're slightly more okay with it now. No, because after then, I were like, so I. Re- this is why I even am telling this story is because people were coming up to me afterwards and they were like, Jesse, you have been able to make change from the inside, and mm. we, nobody has ever. We've been trying to do this for years and years, but mm. we haven't been able to because like a lot of the campaigners and conservationists don't work for Subway. Yeah. So, or they don't work for these big organizations. So it was just a coincidence that I kind of had a part-time job and I was like in the conservation industry where maybe a lot of people, actually a lot of conservationists do, but it just kind I of... Like most people have a <laughs> job at like McDonald's at some point in But it's life. just like the fact that I was not in the conservation space allowed me to achieve more of my conservation goals than if I was not working for Subway. Yeah. So... I think that's the point is like... You had a lot more to go off than like some subway employee who just read one article about palm oil. Yeah. Like right off the onset, you knew a lot more. So just, I guess to clarify, like um, I, they said in the meeting, I think they were really scared because I decreased their sales overnight because <laughs> I had like a two page spread. It actually worked, the boycott. Yeah, I had like a big spread in the newspaper and a lot of people didn't even know palm oil was in subway. So that was their... When I buy a sandwich, it comes wrapped up in paper. Like it doesn't say palm oil. Yeah, because it's on the on bread it. and cookie ingredients. It's not on like the whole sandwich ingredients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, like I think people didn't know palm oil was even in Subway, so that was just used as an educational thing more than a, I don't know anything else. But I didn't follow it up, even though they said they would take it out by 2015, because I learned from being invited to oil palm conferences getting my degree and going over there that boycotting is not the solution for all of the reasons we talked about before Mm. and um i didn't even mention that in the book like i hope people acknowledge that i am not promoting uh boycotting that's just a story that happened to me (laughs) i realized this too late that i i didn't clarify that because i kind of hope that people understand that by me going to north sumatra to to do my honors degree that i would have worked this out but maybe I needed to be more clear. I didn't think of this till way too late. It was already published by the time I had this realization. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost similar with like, um, ethically sourced coffee beans and stuff. Like there's heaps of like dodgy stuff that happens in countries growing coffee beans and exploiting local labor. And civics. And like the, the solution isn't to stop buying all coffee. Cause like poor little coffee beans, they didn't do the wrong doing. <laughs> It's like trying to make international laws and regulations to limit, you know, the expectation of people. What's actually challenging is, so at all the oil palm conferences, at the end of the day, there was no set conclusions on how to communicate things because it's not black and white. Like you can't say boycott palm oil and the like sustainable palm oil, if it's labeled, might still have like crude palm oil mixed into it. Like it's very hard to communicate what what like normal people should do. 
And it's I, not something like aerosols that kill the ozone layer. Yeah. And like, the problem is this exact chemical and we need to get rid of it. <laughs> yeah. It's That's like, almost a bit more easier. It's very, a lot of things in conservation are hard to communicate because it's, it's not black and white. And when you're talking to the public, they need something that is black and white. So even the fact that like you have been to an oil palm plantation and you know how complex it is, maybe even just have a conversation with normal people is enough to even instill that not everything is black and white. Like maybe just having that conversation and because I used to be a very black and white child like that was <laughs> well, most people are everyone's problem with me growing up is that I would do essays for school and it would be titled like we are killing our cousins and it would be about like <laughs> deforestation in Malaysia <laughs> we and still then, are though <laughs> yeah but you're not wrong I was very like all or nothing like there's no gray in the middle and my a lot of my conservation journey has been learning to see the gray and learning to see that like in fact poachers aren't the problem maybe the black market and the ivory trade is the problem the poachers have families they're just trying to support like we can't label things as like blanket bad and blanket good because rarely is anything 100 percent bad or 100 percent good it's yeah it's just complicated yeah life is complicated but a lot of like conservation marketing can't be complicated you need people to have a tangible action yeah so if you are in science communication uh, this is kind of maybe irrelevant but i really recommend going onto um, conservation optimism's website and using their toolkit for effective positive communication because it gives you solutions well it gives you the tools to be like solution-based to think about if you're victimizing or villainizing anyone. And I think maybe we can help each other with using our all of our collective skills, probably if we're able to communicate where those skills can be used and how they should be used in more like solution-based communication. Mm. For instance, like 2040, I love that documentary because it was the first solutions-based documentary I've ever seen for environmental it wasn't just polar bears drowning. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> like actually, two hours. I think the problem was, though, it's like this is what governments can do. This is what nations can do. It's not what this is what you can do. So I feel like if we can all start constructing our messaging like this is what you can do, it would be so useful because we all have skills Like you might think, oh, Todd's in IT. He's not a conservationist. I don't have to like campaign my Instagram post to him. I don't have to target them at him. But realistically, he can fly drones. He can use photography. He can make apps. Like, this is an interesting thing. My dad is also in IT. I know, very Freudian. Come at me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he created this app. I can't remember what the initial purpose of the app was, but a marine biology center in America picked it up and have been using it for something. Also, I don't know enough information about okay. it. This is a great antidote. But actually, he's been getting messages ever since from this marine biology place saying, can you update the app to do this? We've been using it for this. It would be cool if it had this feature. So even if like a lot of IT people, you could be just producing apps or producing software or producing technologies that you think may not be useful. Well, you might not even have conservation in mind, but they could be the exact niche thing that conservationists need. Yeah. I think a lot of technology skills, it's very, very transferable to other industries. For sure. Especially with the future of the world is very technology based. Yeah. Robots are taking over. I picked the right horse to bet on <laughs> career wise. But we always talk about this like with um, specific things like turtle trackers, how like you have to consider like the depth of the ocean, which like interferes with the signal oh, and that... making sure it sticks to the turtle. Yeah. Trying to make like a GPS wireless turtle tracker, given like where turtles go is like almost peak engineering challenge yeah and it will be easier to make a rocket to mars i would wager (laughs) well like how many conservationists have an engineering background so i think this is why it's important if you don't have the skills to team up with people that do like i think if conservationists stick together where we have a tiny pool of skills we can use and when i say tiny i mean acknowledging all of the skills that we do have it's still limited because not all of us have like health degrees we don't have engineering degrees we don't have yeah. coding abilities media marketing skills R. yeah so it's good to team up with people and i think that's why lonely conservationist has been so amazing for me is that there's been people that haven't like have a history of marketing but have a passion for orchids and now i can be like hey can you help me with this or like because they haven't been able to get a job in conservation they've got a job in something else and they have all this background 
and it's like so amazing to have this such diversity of skills which I can I'm not saying like benefit on but like we can all <laughs> trade and help each other with the different skills we work have together. work together that's what I love and I think that's I think if you have people in your life that are outside of conservation maybe a good way to engage them in conservation is to bring them in with their applied skills and say like hey can you help me with this you're really good at this and maybe together working on that project they'll be able to learn the importance of whatever they're doing like hey you're really good um, with handiwork can you help me make a bee hotel oh what's a bee hotel and then they'll learn about bees <laughs> Bee hotels are an actual Poor thing. bees stuck living in hotels. Don't even have real houses to live in anymore. I know. That's the sad part of the world is that we have to start <laughs> bee hotels. But I just think, like, actually, that's a good... That, I think that's a good, um, like, thing to end on is that if we start to acknowledge the skills we have, that's one thing. But then really acknowledging the skills that other people have because I think when I, when I think of, like, neurosurgeon, I'm like, whoa... Their, their precision must be amazing their medical history like they must I don't think of how when I see like maybe someone that studies sharks traditionally I don't think of them as like having the same amount of prestige of skills that a neurosurgeon has when like realistically everyone has this like broad array of skills that we should just we should find out about them and put them to use <laughs> yeah so if you have um, a friend or family, someone in your life that you want to engage in conservation, find out what their passions are, what their interests are, work out how you can exploit them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, make their interests align with yours and now and you can make use of them. The best advice I have is if you have a partner that's outside of conservation, just train them up and they're <laughs> going to do all the science communication that you could have ever wished for. <laughs> Todd has been stellar in communicating things. And it's like, it would really surprise me the first time you said, oh, people saw this on the news. And I was like, what do you mean you think like this? This is what's actually happening. And I was like, I'm so proud. <laughs> but yeah, we shouldn't be underestimating the skills that we have. And we shouldn't be underestimating how the skills of the people around us can help us in our own journeys. I think if we all work together, like lonely conservationists, we're not so lonely anymore. <laughs> so if we all work together, I think the things that we can achieve will just be incredible. So that's it for chapter five of how to conserve conservationists. Thank you for coming on this journey where we explore all of the skills we have and how they're so incredibly useful to both conservation and just generally the world. If you want to see some more amazingly skilled people, check out the blog at www.lonelyconservationist.com. You can also check us out on Instagram at Lonely Conservationist and Twitter at Lonely Conserve. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash lonelyconservationist. And you can now get the book if you want to follow along with us chapter by chapter and contribute to the conversation in your mind because... This is unfortunately a one-way conversation between Todd and I, but I love hearing your feedback, so please let me know what you think. And I think that's it for this week. I'll catch you later.